text, pray back to God your own study of the text. Pray to Him about what you think His Word means, because He, by the personal Holy Spirit, will illuminate or enlighten your mind to the understanding. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But pray back to God. Ask Him to correct any thinking that you might have wrong. And then you can talk over with the Lord any difficult passages. And at that point, your study would pretty much be able to be done, maybe, because we never stop studying. Now, here's a simple question that I have for you. As we've gone through this from last night all the way to tonight, does, and I want an honest question, this is a question I want you to answer, does this seem like a lot of work to you? Does it? Yeah. It is, isn't it? Now, let me ask you, is there anything more important than getting right the Word of God? No. Should we invest the time in this? You know, it's amazing that I know people that invest enough time in the Marvel movies or the Star Wars movies or anything like that. They know all the characters. They know all these little details of it. And you ask them about the Bible, and like, I don't really get that. But I'm a Christian. What's going to be more important? When we get to heaven, are we going to be asked about Marvel movies or this? What has eternal impact? Marvel movies or this? Guess what? Our social media isn't going to be in heaven. Right? This is what's important. There's nothing more important to invest our time into than this right here. This is what we don't want to get wrong. So we want to invest as much as we can into getting this right because we are commissioned to go and make disciples and teach them all things that Christ has taught us. Well, if we're not studying, guess what? We don't have anything to teach them else. So one reason we do all this is for, for us to be able to teach others and know what God's Word says. Let me give you one last important thing. It's this. If this seems like a lot of work to you, if it seems like this would be overwhelming, first off, it, it is overwhelming, start small. Start at the beginning. Don't try to do it all, all at once. But here's the thing I also want you to think about. This is what your pastor does every single Sunday. You see, this is what's involved every Sunday when a pastor gives a sermon. Every Sunday I preach... I put 30 hours average into every single sermon. I do all of this that we went over every single week with a brand new passage. And that's what a godly pastor does. If you have a pastor who is doing that every single week, pray for him. This is not easy work to get into this book every week and do all of this work Every week, pour yourself into this and then bring it to a congregation. And I'll tell you why that's so scary. Because when you stand before a congregation, you're basically saying, thus says the Lord. And you do not want to be wrong. So what does a godly pastor do? He studies hard to make sure when he says something, it's accurate. Because he's accountable to God for that. So then what's our responsibility to our pastor? Pray for him. Support him. Make sure that if there's things you could do to take distractions out of his day, do that for him. So that he can focus on the most important thing he has for the week. To bring you the word of God. It's the most important thing he could do in his life. It's the most important thing we could do in our lives. Is to, to be before God's word and understand his word. All right. Now we're going to end up having a Q&A session, but before we do, I just want to give you guys some things from the ministry. Here's some ways to keep in touch with us. You can go to strivingforeternity.org. Um, make it easier for you if you want. If, for those people who only like to remember a couple of letters, you can go to sfe.bible, and that'll take you to the same site. sfe.bible takes you to strivingforeternity.org. Um, you can follow us on Facebook as long as we're still on Facebook. We're probably going to be getting kicked off there soon. But we have a Striving for Eternity ministry page. Now that's more one directional. That's us talking to you. But we also have a Striving for Eternity group on Facebook where we communicate, where we have more interaction, things like that. Um, actually, I could, I'll have to change that. I've, I've just deleted Twitter. I can't replace it with 
you know, with Parlor because, well, I'm off of there, but that is my handle for Gab, if you're on Gab. You know, this is probably going to change on a weekly basis at this rate. <laughs> but if you're, if you're on Gab, you can find me at, at, at Andrew Rappaport. I'm also on Facebook for now. Um, another thing I want to say is that everything that we've been sharing with you is part of our Striving for Eternity Academy. Now, in the, in the room in there, I have our different academy classes. Um, one of the things that we have in, the, in there is our School of Biblical Hermeneutics. It's one of the classes. You can watch the videos for free. But the syllabus is we charge for. That's actually how we pay for the productions. Why do we do it that way? These classes are used around the world <clears throat> to teach pastors and, and people everywhere around the world. We, we, have, we teach pastors in China because, well, at the time, we were a small enough ministry that, that the Chinese government didn't stop us. So we had pastors in China that were using our materials. That was all they had to go on to be able to get training. They couldn't get training there. We have pastors in Chile, in Africa, that all use our materials, and it's free to them because all they need is internet and English. So what we do is, for those that want to go deeper, we have a syllabus. That's where that's what costs money, and and this lets us do the other for free. And so if you end up uh, wanting to be part of the, part of that, you can go to strivingforeternityacademy.org, and it takes you to the page on our website that gives you all of our classes. We have our syllabuses here. We, if we do not have, a, if we run out of syllabuses, one of the things we do is, because we don't bring a lot of the syllabuses, they're heavy for flights. Uh, what we do is if you order anything here that we don't have, we ship it free. Okay, so if you do orders for syllabuses here, one of the other things about it is the way, only when we are at seminars and conferences, we give discounts on the syllabuses. Online, all the syllabuses are $25. But here, when we do seminars, you can get any four for uh, 75 or all six for a hundred. And so we do that. This, the syllabus that we've been going through is this one right here, the School of Biblical Hermeneutics. We have 20 lessons online for free. The syllabus gives you more than the handout that we just went over. A couple resources that we have as well as some of our books. Um, what do we believe? It examines this, this uh, six major doctrines of six major Western religions. So we, we look at their authority, their view of God, their view of Christ, their view of man's sinfulness, salvation, and end times. And we examine Judaism, Catholicism, Islam, Jehovah, Witness, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, and Christianity. Okay? We're doing original source, so we're not trying to refute them. We're telling you what they believe so that when you engage these people, they end up doing what they do to me all the time. You really understand my religion. You're not misrepresenting me. You know what happens when I have conversations with, with uh, Muslims? They tell me I believe in three gods. And I say, no, I don't. They, yes, you do. I say, no, I don't. I think I know better what I believe than you. Your Quran says I believe in three gods, but no Christian defines the Trinity as three gods. It's one God. But they only have their, their Quran. Well, their Quran is wrong. <laughs> right? So what happens when at the end of the conversations, I, I always ask Muslims this question, have I misrepresented anything that I've said about your religion? They always say no. I said, okay, but you've misrepresented my religion. So what we've seen is that I've done my homework on yours, you haven't done your homework on mine. Will you read a Bible? Every time I've done that, they will accept the Bible. Especially when they realize that the New Testament is about the size of the Quran, they figure it's not too bad. Uh, another, another book is What Do We Believe? Um, this is not a very thick book, okay? Here it is. It's 200 pages. This doesn't look like anything like John MacArthur's latest, uh, you know, systematic theology or William Grudem's or any of the others. You can get through this. But I've basically been told that because of the way that I write, uh, my books are easy to understand and they're, they're good for cross-references. But it goes through Christ a Christian systematic theology. What is it that we believe? The, the, it's going to go through the authority of the Christian faith, basically how we got what, what, our Bible and how we have it. It's going to go through biblical reliability. This you don't find meant often. This is an essential thing if you're going to go out and evangelize and defend the faith. The number one attack we have as Christians is that people think you can't trust the Bible. It's been edited. It's been changed. It's been corrupted. I address that in this chapter. The Bible is more accurate than CNN every day of the week. Amen. Okay? So we look at the view of God. We look at the view of Jesus Christ. We look at man's sinfulness. 
I pulled in a chapter from Dr. Silvestro's book on creation, fall, and promise. And then we look at the view of, of salvation the, and a historical understanding of the church and then a view of end times. Okay? So that book is very helpful in understanding what Christians believe. Then we have Dr. Silvestro's book on the origin of kinds. This, as I said last night, is a unique book. What this book does is it marries three things together. Presuppositional apologetics, creation science, and evangelism. I know many books on those subjects individually. I know no book that brings those three together and shows how they interact with one another. It's the only book I know that does it. Okay? It's an, it's a, an amazing book to have. Another book that we have out there is Sharing the Good News with Mormons. If you have people that are Mormons, then you, you'll learn a lot about Mormonism through this, but I'll tell you what you're going to learn even more about evangelism. I'm one of 24 authors on this book. Every chapter is completely independent of one another. Many of them you can use for people other than Mormons. I got stuck reading the, writing the chapter on open-air evangelism. I wanted to do my friend Matt Slick's chapter on textual criticism, which is what I wrote in, in chapter two of my book on what do we believe. I had more up-to-date information. I think that I could have written it better than him, in my opinion. <laughs> but I was stuck because basically I was told that there's only a couple of people in the world that the, the, that the, the general editors knew could do open-air evangelism better. I was told they don't know anyone that does it better than me, so I got stuck doing the chapter that no one ever wants to read. <laughs> but we have authors, uh, Sean McDowell, many of you may know his father, Josh McDowell, uh, Jay Warner Wallace, Matt Slick, myself, Robert Bowman, Bill McKeever, um, Matt Middleberg, Eric Johnson, Sandra Tanner. If you do anything with, with Mormonism, you know the name Sandra Tanner. Um, another thing that, another, some re other resources that we have, and that we have that book out here as well. Uh, Another resource that we have for you that you could do, especially if any of you have a smartphone, you can take your smartphone out right now and you can open your podcast app, because most of us have that, and go search for Rap Report. And you could, you could listen to my weekly podcast. I actually have another podcast that's called Apologetics Live. That's a live podcast. And here's the thing you could do with that. If you go to apologeticslive.com, any Thursday night, 8 o'clock Eastern Time, so it's a different time zone, okay, for you guys that's going to be 7 o'clock. So if you, if you go there at 7 o'clock your time, 7 to 9, you, there's a link for you to go in. And you can ask any question you want. Even if you have a challenge, go for it. That's what we do. If you ever want to know where Dr. Silvestro and my office hours are, well, it's Thursday, 8 to 10 Eastern Time. You can call and ask anything you want. I tell people all the time, I can answer any question you have about God in the Bible. I'm confident of that. I believe I don't know is a perfectly good answer. <laughs> we also, my podcast and my two podcasts I just mentioned are part of our Christian podcast community. If you listen to podcasts, we have a whole community. We have over 40 podcasts right now. Uh, we cover everything. You want a podcast for women? We have it. You want podcasts on homeschooling? We got it. You want podcasts for parenting? We have it. You want podcasts for men? We have it. You want podcasts for theology? We have it. You want ones on apologetics? We have it. You want ones on post-millennialism? Sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me give you another, some other research. We have some other things out there, but let me give you another resource on what we've been talking about. Your pastor wrote a book. We actually sell it. I, didn't ha I don't have it on the table because he sells it. Th this book w is very interesting. If you haven't gotten it and haven't read it, this is probably one of the, the, the best primers to just get started on how to interpret. This is the, it's, it's not very long. Okay, It's easy to read. He steps you through it in an easy to understand way so that you can understand how to interpret the scriptures. Okay. Um, with the books, I'll, I'll just do a plea, okay? The more you buy, the less I have to go home with. And it means that I, it, it gives my arms a rest. I'm going to be going through some snow, it seems like. <laughs> um, so it would be good. Uh, but, but we have that. I'll mention again for those, uh, we are doing a trip to Israel. It's filling up quickly. If you want, I have a flyer on that that I can give you. Uh, if you want to look at where we're going, I know it's expensive. 
but it is expensive to go to Israel. But if you go to IsraelTour2021.com, you can sign up to join us. Uh, Dr. Silvestro and myself will be speaking along with, with uh, Justin Peters, uh, David Cunningham, and a, a couple of other pastor friends of ours. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of, uh, we're going to have about 20 different devotionals along with our guide do, explaining things along the way. One last thing that I would say just uh, is, is that we are a ministry striving for eternity, is a ministry that we, we could use help. Uh, one of the things that we like to let people know, just so that people are aware, is the fact that we, we have the strangest ministry model of any ministry that I know. I don't know a single ministry anywhere in the world that does our model. We, most ministries, like to target large churches so that they can get the large crowd and have lots of people there. We target smaller churches where they can't afford to fly us in, they can't afford to put us up, they can't afford to, to, to pay us anything. That's who we target. And people go, wait, how do you make money doing that? We trust God. And he brings us monthly supporters. And monthly supporters let us keep coming into churches that can't afford us, and, and we know we'll, we lose money at. But here's the thing. I know we, Dr. Sebastian and I have the privilege of traveling all over the country, speaking at, at big conferences and little conferences. And I can tell you, for a lot of guys, they like the big conferences because when they go to the big conferences, oh, it's great having all the people there and they come up afterwards, pat you on their back. One of the things I notice about big conferences, even some of the smaller conferences, you know, Brother Brandon here runs a conference here in, in well, in, now it's a different state. You guys are close to it, but in, in Indiana called the Cruciform Conference. And that's probably what, <coughs> you'd say 200, 250? Is it people? That? Yeah, how many people go? Uh, yeah, something like that. I so, was only okay, 150, yeah. maybe. 150, 200? Yeah. All right. And you know what happens when people go to that conference? Everyone gets like on a spiritual high at that conference. You get the good preaching, you get the good teaching, you get all the fellowship, and all these people get excited and it ends up energizing their spiritual life. We're striving for eternity, we like to bring that type of experience to small churches where no one else is going to go to. That's what we do. We are a discipling ministry and we, we try to disciple in a lot of different ways. This is the most fun way to do it, to come into a church, to give a training and watch people get excited about studying the Word of God. So we do it through podcasts. We do it through our academy. We do it through seminars. We have a lot of different ways we disciple, but we can't do it without support. And so we do always make an appeal that if you can help us out monthly, even for a dollar a month, we have donors that give a dollar a month, and we appreciate them. If you can, if you can donate, just, you just go to strivingforeternity.org slash support, and there you can you would be able to get uh, the page to donate. So that wraps things up. I got one more thing to give away, and it's going to be really simple. I mentioned four things last night and tonight that start with the letter I. A good Baptist pastor always has to alliterate. I best I'm not a good Baptist pastor because a good Baptist pastor has three points in conclusion, and I had four points. So I had four, four words that start with I that are the process that we talked about. Can anyone give me what those four are without looking at your notes? <laughs> I'm looking, though. Yeah, don't look. Don't look. That's so you got to raise your hand if you think you can give me all four. I like my If you say it out loud, someone else is going to raise their hand and they're going to get it. I forgot the other two, so. All right. Who thinks they could do it? Someone take a shot at it. I got to be quiet so somebody else. Yeah, he can't, he can't do it. Okay, three girls in the back. If you guys work together, you can do it. The, the first one we were trying to figure out what's, what style of literature it was. What was that called? I... Huh? Well, the interpretation is one of them. We, we, but that's, that's the third one. Huh? Investigation. Investigation is the second one. Now you weren't here last night, so maybe someone will give them a hint. What do you think? What was the first one that we talked about last night? When we look at it, we, we try to figure out what type of literature it is. You want to give, a, give them a hint? Identification, was that what you were saying? Yeah, so you want, you want to call that one out? Identification, good, so identification? You got identification, you got the investigation, 
You got the interpretation, then we apply it to ourselves and we call that impl implementation. Very good. Here you go. <laughs> that was an excellent job. Yeah. So there you guys go. That's, that's, She's college. She's there's two of our conferences that we did um, that you can enjoy on CD. So I, I hope this is helpful. Now here's what we're going to do with the time remaining. Uh, I'm going to answer any question you have specifically about what we talked about. Afterwards, I'll talk about any, I'll answer any question you have. If you want to know how many angels can ha dance on the head of a pin, I can answer that. I don't know. <laughs> I can answer that. I don't know. So, any, any questions that you have? Explain, and I'm uh, above, beyond, above the millennials, podcasts. Okay, what's a podcast? Because I am not computer yeah. savvy. Well, I don't carry what, yeah. Actually, do, do you carry a smartphone? Not all the time, no. Not all the time. No, she's got a smartphone. So, yeah, it's, but uh, it's smarter than I am. So. <laughs> on, on most of the smartphones, they have these little apps called podcast apps. On there. And so oh, if yeah. you search in the app. thing that says okay. podcast, you find it. And then on there, there's a way to search. And I gave you these cards, and right. our podcasts are, you can search there. So what is that? The, what it is, is it's something that, well, the way podcast works is when there's a new episode, it downloads right to your phone. And then you, you, it, you can just hit play and it plays the audio. Okay. And the nice thing is with it, you have it with you everywhere you go. But if you want, you could, oh, if you're like by a computer, you can go to the website and you can just click on anything that interests you. We have a ton of podcasts out there. So lots of different podcasts and they each have different episodes. And you can just look for whatever interests you okay. and just hit play. Do you have your podcast on Sermon Audio or just the podcast? Catches? No. Uh, I won't put it, I, I, as of right now, I won't put it on Sermon Audio, or at least it won't, it won't be there primarily, but we have it right now on um, every, everywhere, like, like Apple and Google and all that. Uh, I may put it on Sermon Audio, but I won't initially have it, like I won't host it there. Yeah. Because, well, technical issues, if you put it on Sermon Audio, you can't move from there. Uh -huh. Yeah. This is for your former board member. Do you, do you believe in flying demon day? <laughs> you put him up to that. No, I don't. <laughs> Flying Demon Babies is some, one of my former bo board members. He, when we get to Genesis chapter 6, it talks about the sons of God. There's lots of discussion on who are the sons of God. Are they, are they men or are they demons? My position is that they're demons. My former board member believes that it's the line of Seth versus the line of Cain. Read the context and tell me anywhere where it mentions anything about Seth or Cain there, it doesn't exist. Sons of God is always a reference used for angels. So when we compare scripture with scripture, we only see that with angels. So we'll say, well, how in the world can demons have relations with women and produce children? I don't know. But if that's what scripture says, that's what I go with. Can I explain it? No, I can't. But it, that is the position that has been historically held by uh, you know, the Jewish rabbis, by the early church, um, and it is one that puzzles us. So, uh, so the offspring, as my board member likes to say, must be flying demon babies. Well, I don't know anything that says they were flying, and I don't know what they produced. All we know that they produced is very large children. They're called giants, <laughs> or Nephilim. I want to so, point out, he moved far enough away that you couldn't throw your water bottle at him when he asked that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, I can reach you there. <laughs> Any other questions? You look like one's forming. Well, yes. there's one forming. Yeah. Years and years ago, we did kind of a, uh, a Sunday evening thing here. One of the things that I kind of, in my mind, got out of it was, and kind of goes with Anthony's, maybe a little bit tomorrow, but creation and things like that. The Neanderthal man and, and people like that. <clears throat> Is there a possibility that they could have existed? Because in Genesis it says he made it. People and man his image. In his image. <clears throat> so here's a couple things. One, when it says that he made man in his image, you have a lot of different views of that. If you take the Mormons, the Mormons will say that we were made in the image of God, therefore God must have been a man like us, and that we could then become gods. Hmm, that's off the wall. But yes, that is, I did say yesterday, Mormonism is good science fiction, bad theology. Okay? 
What it means to be made in the image of God is that there's certain attributes that God communicates to us that he has and we have. And that's what it means to be made in the image of God. We have intellect. God has intellect. We have emotions. God has emotions. But God has things we don't have. God's omniscient. We're not omniscient. We would like to know what our wives think. We'd like to understand them. We just don't want them to understand what we think, right? <laughs> we just want that one one direction, right? So what are we, we, there's certain things we don't have. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. Now, when you talk about Neanderthal man, um, can those exist? Actually, uh, those did exist. They just weren't what we think they are. Every one of the fossils that they have, well, most, I'll let me phrase it, most of the fossils that they have, Piltdown man, Nebraska man, uh, you know, Neanderthal man. <clears throat> when you actually research them, every one of them is either a man or an ape. And that's it, except for Nebraska man. Nebraska man was a missing link that was developed where they developed a whole thing from teeth. And later they discovered it's the teeth of a pig. So what did they do? They did great artist renderings of something that never existed. <laughs> okay? But it is still sometimes in some textbooks. <laughs> you, have, you had a, one, uh, I think it was Lucy, where they, they had her, and yet when you really realize it, it was a woman with rickets. And so you, you have all these different cases where you find out that it's, you know, that th there's, they've done, there's things that have happened to their bodies that have done us. Now if you want to look at an example, go look up um, the Mayans. Look up, just do a Google search on Mayan skulls. What you're going to see is that the Mayan women from very young, and ladies, you're going to be glad that we don't do this, from very young, when they were children, they would wrap their heads in bands so that they'd have this elongated skull. And they grew the skull. They thought it was pretty to have this skull that, that is. So when you look at their skulls, they look like aliens. So if I took those skulls, guess what? We were, we, there's a missing link between us and aliens. You know, the alien movie, I guess, because aliens don't really exist, right? But it's, what, it's this elongated skull. Uh, no, that was just, that was purposeful. They're still human beings. So no, there, there, are, there isn't any missing link because we were created, Scripture is very clear that God created Adam and Eve after their kind. And so they're, they're formed after one another. It's a very important distinction that God has through Genesis 1 and 2 is the word kind. And that's why Anthony's book on the origin of kinds is so important. It's because the animal kingdoms, they're all created after their kind. When they come onto the, the ark, the two by two by their kind. And so they're, they were a mixture. In fact, that's a, it's genetically impossible for them. One of the things, and, and this is kind of off topic, but one of the things that you end up finding is that evolution is scientifically impossible. Evolution requires the gaining and reproducing of new information. Okay? In our DNA, when we have new information, it's called a mutation. Do you want to know how many beneficial and reproducible mutations we have found in the world? Zero. None. There's some that people will say are beneficial mutations, like celiac disease. But that is only beneficial if you happen to be around malaria. Everywhere else it will kill you, but if, it will protect you from malaria. But it will still kill you if, you if if you don't do things right. It only protects you from one thing. It, it, it's actually like sickle cell anemia. Yeah. Sickle cell anemia, sorry. What did I say? Which one did I? You said celiac disease. Oh. Sorry. I get them wrong sometimes. I was going to say, kind of just adding something related to that, the evolutionists will even make a distinction between micro and macro evolution, say, micro evolution long enough just leads to macro evolution, but micro evolution is the loss of genetic material. Mm -hmm. Their idea of macro evolution is the gaining of genetic material. Yep. So they basically say if you lose it over enough time frames that you have somehow end up with Correct. more in the end. And that's, and, and I need, yeah, this is what I was trying to get to because this is why I say it's, it's scientifically impossible. Okay. I'm going to use different terms than micro and macro. I'm going to use, Christians use the term micro and macro. Mm -hmm. The science community would use general and, and special. Mm -hmm. Okay? But what you have in evolution is a bait and switch that's being done. Okay? We end up seeing, and this is something that's biblical, creation scientists believe this, 
that we can lose genetic information. Okay? If, if we stay within one community long enough, we our children, 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 we end up losing, each generation loses genetic information. So you do that in certain areas and certain traits are going to be lost and never... So you go to, to Asia, you are not getting a blonde hair Asian. They lost that genetic ability. Evolution is the idea that you gain information and yet what we see in science is that you lose information. It's backwards. All right? The bait and switch is that, well, if you see this happening within a kind, that that will eventually create a new kind. Now, they don't use the term kinds. But the thing is, is that what you end up seeing with this is, for this to be true, you have to gain information, and what we actually see in science is the loss of information. So what they do is they talk about what we would call special evolution or microevolution, these small adaptations, and they end up saying, well, since that happens, you can have a monkey become a man. How do you make that leap? Right? That doesn't happen. Because they're building into complexity. They're, they're saying it gets more and more complex. And yet what we see is a more and more of a breakdown. All right? And so evolution is actually scientifically impossible. Why do people believe in evolution? Very, very simple reason. They don't want to be accountable to God. That's what it comes down to. People don't want to have to believe in a God. So if they can find a way to explain the universe without God, they can. But they can't. You know why? One very simple thing. For someone to say there is no God, what does that require? Well, one thing it requires is an ability to reason. Because you have to reason there is no God, right? Something else it requires. It requires you to have an intelligence. To be able to, to know, that, to, have, to be able to intellectually understand that God doesn't exist. Also it requires knowledge. So you know this. You know the fact that God doesn't exist. All of these things are in play. But you want to know what's true about all those things? They're immaterial. They're not chemical. If there is no God, we are nothing but chemical reactions. That's all we are. But knowledge, truth, ability to reason, intellect, those are immaterial things. Chemical reactions cannot produce them. The fact that someone says God does not exist first requires God to give them a God-given reason, ability to reason, to reason God doesn't exist. Thus, as the psalmist would say, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Because you need to use your God-given ability to reason, to reason that God does not exist. But God first has to exist to come to that reason. Now, I will admit, if you want a great argument, if you speak to someone that says they're an atheist, and they say there is no God, our day and age, we have this great, great argument now. It's really funny to watch atheists when you use their own thinking against them. It's a funny thing to watch. I get these guys to say, there is no God. I go, okay, so you believe we're just, the, we're just the result of chemical reactions. Yes. So, I mean, I'm only going to react to the way that my chemicals in my body are designed, correct? Yes. I say, so I can't react outside of my chemical reactions, right? No. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that people could be transgender? Can someone be born biologically male and yet think they're a female? Oh yeah, I do. Okay, help me understand something. They're biologically male. Their chemicals are male. You just said that we only do what's part of our chemistry. If they're biologically male, their chemistry is male, they're gonna think male, they're gonna be male, they're going to be a male, that's it. They can't do anything else. We've already established that. How do they get to think they're a female? There must be something other than their chemicals then, huh? And then you watch their heads explode. It's, it's a brilliant thing to watch. Because they just go, uh, 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 you're wrong. You're an idiot. I'm getting out of here as fast as I can. <laughs> Which is usually what happens. We, we sometimes get that on Apologetics Live. It's fun. The atheists don't come as, in as much anymore. I guess they don't like being embarrassed. I don't know. <laughs> I, all I do is ask questions. That's all I do. Any other questions? This is your turn to ask questions. All right. 
Well, I, I thank you on behalf of Fred's attorney for having us out. Like I said, we have, we have plenty of materials out there uh, that you can pick up. Uh, if any of you want to talk about coming to Israel,